Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan and today we're tackling a heart defect known as coarctation of the aorta, or you might hear people call this a coarct. This is one of my favorite heart defects to talk about, but first let's kick it off with our practice question as always. So the nurse is assessing a client with a suspected coarctation of the aorta, which findings would support this diagnosis. Select all that apply. We have bounding radial pulses, diminished pedal pulses, cool lower extremities, a wide pulse pressure, and headaches and nosebleeds. So first to get us started, let's define exactly what a coarctation is. We know when we're dealing with a heart defect, we need to look at the anatomy of that plumbing, how the blood is supposed to flow through the heart and what's going on when maybe those structures didn't form perfectly. So in a coarctation, we have a narrowing for a coarctation of the aorta. That is basically just a congenital narrowing of that aorta. Remember, the aorta, of course, is the main vessel that carries oxygenated blood from the heart out to the body. So it's an artery. It goes away from the heart. It is kind of like a highway. It is wide. It is big. It is designed to move a lot of traffic, in this case, blood, efficiently. When we have a coarctation, a narrowing, part of that highway is under construction, and boom, it goes down to a single lane. You know how that goes. Traffic backs up. We've got a bottleneck there. You can still get through. The blood can still get through. But due to that bottleneck, traffic is going to build up on the side before the narrowing, before we go down to that one lane. Now, here is the key part of the anatomy that will help you understand everything else. The narrowing, that coarctation, impedes blood flow to the lower half of the body. Now, the critical point here that's going to help you understand everything else is exactly where this narrowing occurs. It is going to occur in the part of the aorta that has branched off and is sending blood to the upper half of the body. So after that little branch, we then get the narrowing down to the single lane road, which means that blood is flowing just fine to the upper half of the body because the highway is not under construction. It is wide. We're getting all that blood flow. Traffic is moving along. But then after we've sent the blood to the upper half, we go down to that single lane. We get that narrowing and we get a bottleneck of traffic. So it's hard to get flow to the lower half of the body. All right. So if you remember anything, just remember a lot of blood up top and not a lot of blood down below. That leads to all the signs and symptoms. And if you get a question about coarctations on your exam, it is probably going to be the specific signs and symptoms that come with it. Okay, so what's that? Lots of blood up top means bounding pulses, plus three, plus four radial brachial pulses. Hypertension, high blood pressure, but only in the upper extremities because blood is backing up before that narrowing. We're going to have really good perfusion. We're warm, we're pink. We have a quick capillary refill lots of blood up top. It is exactly the opposite down below. We have weak or even absent pulses. So pedal or popliteal pulses might be absent or even just a plus one. The blood pressure is going to be hypotensive. We take a popliteal blood pressure on the calf. That's going to be much, much lower. And then when we think about perfusion, we're not getting a lot of blood. So we're cool, pale, clammy, mottled. And that's because we have that bottleneck, traffic can't really get past that narrowing down to the lower half of the body. Now, the body is going to try to adapt. So the left ventricle is going to be pumping real hard to try to get blood across that narrowing. And that can lead to left ventricular hypertrophy. Hypertrophy means that muscle is getting bigger because it's working out. It's pumping against a lot of pressure. It gets bigger. That can then lead into congestive heart failure if it goes untreated. 
Now, hopefully we're going to catch this sooner rather than later, but if this does continue to go untreated, think about all the things that are going to happen due to that high volume of blood in the upper half of the body. We're going to be having headaches, maybe nosebleeds because we're hypertensive up there, but we're not getting a lot of blood down to the legs. So we might have that cool, pale, clammy mottled. The legs are going to start to get crampy due to that lack of perfusion. The big takeaway, though, is that stark contrast between upper body and lower body and how those symptoms show where the blood is going. Remember, if you take one thing away from this episode, just remember, lots of blood up top, not a lot down below. And then think through, okay, what signs would show me lots of blood? That's, you know, the bounding pulses, the hypertension, the the good perfusion, we're nice and pink and warm. Those are all the things you're going to see up top with lots of blood versus down below, not having a lot of blood, weak pulses, hypotension, and poor perfusion. Now, before I get into my story, I have a little bit of an atypical story. I have seen a ton of babies with coarctation, but we usually catch it in infancy. And that's because we have a screening for congenital heart disease that we do before any baby gets discharged. It's super simple. Basically, we put a pulse ox on the right hand and one of their feet, and we see if there is a difference. If we're getting a pretty equal amount of blood up top and down below, there shouldn't be much of a difference at all, right? They should be above 95 in both the hand and the feet. But if there is a big difference, let's say the hand is 99 and the foot is only 80, That is a huge gradient, is what we would say, or a difference, and that would alert us to, okay, we don't have an equal distribution of blood going on here. We need to do an echocardiogram, that fancy ultrasound of the heart, and just dig in and see what's going on, okay? But sometimes these are missed in infancy, or they worsen over time. They co-arc and narrow further, leading to more and more symptoms. And that is the story I have today that jumps out at me because it was a little bit different. And so that's just what I remember the most. That's what I'm going to share with you guys. It was actually a six-year-old boy. I was working inpatient and he was what we call a direct admit. So his pediatrician had evaluated him in the office, called us and been like, hey, This kiddo needs to be admitted for X, Y, Z. I don't really need him to go through the emergency room. He's totally stable. So they literally walked onto the floor. We had a room ready for him. That's what a direct admit was at that hospital. Now, he had gone to his pediatrician for headaches and nosebleeds. He also like had some allergies going on. He put him on a Zyrtec. That didn't really help. He came back. He said, oh, maybe your nose has been really dry. We did some saline gel. You know, we treated the headaches with over-the-counter medicine. He came back a third time and they were getting worse and really, really persistent. He was otherwise like pretty active, looked normal, playing with his friends. He had started kindergarten. This was not a kiddo in distress. It was very appropriate for him to be going to his pediatrician. But on his third visit back, the pediatrician's like, why are these headaches and nosebleeds not going away? He did a gradient blood pressure. So he checked his blood pressure up in his arms and down in his legs. So first off, up in his arms was very hypertensive for a six-year-old. 140 over 90 was what I got reported off. And then down in his legs, it was just 100 over 60. So that is what we would call a 40-point gradient. The systolic blood pressure was 40 points higher systolic than it was in the systolic pressure down in his legs, which is a huge difference. And that finding was why the pediatrician was like, you need to go be admitted. You need an echocardiogram. Okay, so he's in the bed. I'm doing my assessment. Starting head to toe, I'm looking at his upper body. It's normal. He's got good pulses. His blood pressure's fine. He's getting perfused up there. He's warm. He's pink. He's got a nice brisk cap refill. It took less than two seconds to see that capillary refill. As I moved down to his feet, much different story. He's cool, pale, clammy. Like you can literally, if I had my hand on his arm and his leg, you could feel a temperature difference. His pulses in his feet were more like plus one. Like we said, that blood pressure was much, much lower. And he had a delayed capillary refill. It was more like four seconds to see that capillary refill 
down on the feet. So a huge difference between just what perfusion looks like up top and down below. So of course, to diagnose this, all the symptoms really fall into place with a coarctation. Think about what brought him into the pediatrician, the headaches and nosebleeds. This is happening from chronic upper body hypertension. He's had high blood pressure up top that has been shunting a lot of blood up into his brain, headaches, a lot of blood in that nose, nosebleeds, okay? So it all kind of fits together. To diagnose it, we need to do that echocardiogram. Again, that is like a fancy ultrasound of the heart that's going to show us the picture. It's also going to show us the blood flow. And just as we thought, there was tons of blood up top, but we could really see where that narrowing was and where that traffic was backing up. So his aorta went down to a single lane, that highway was closed for business, and it was really hard to get blood down to the lower half of the body. The only other thing I can do as the nurse at this point is just continue monitoring. And the big intervention for you to remember is doing something we call four-point blood pressures or four-limb blood pressures. We're going to get a blood pressure on the right arm, the left arm, the right leg, the left leg, all four points. And we're going to document what that gradient is because if it's getting worse, that is a sign that the narrowing, the coarctation is getting worse. So we're keeping an eye on that. Anything over a 20 point gradient, so 20 points difference between the upper and the lowers is a cause for concern. Treatment wise, this is something that really needs a surgical intervention. There's not a lot we can do medically to make that blood flow where it needs to flow. It needs to go into surgery and we need to open up that narrowing. Before they go to surgery, we are really about safety and stabilization. Like we said, we're monitoring those four-point blood pressures. We're keeping the kiddo calm. We're educating the family. We are making sure that he is resting. We don't want heavy exertion until that repair is done because we already have so much upper body hypertension. But we really just want to keep them calm and comfy and monitor until they go to surgery. So there is a few different ways they can fix this in a surgery. This kiddo had something called an end-to-end anastomosis. So basically, you know, if you think of the aorta like a pipe, and in the middle there, we've got that coarctation, that narrowing, they just cut out that part, take the two other ends of the pipe, plug them back together. No more coarctation. Postoperatively, we now focus on monitoring for that perfusion. We should no longer have hypertension up top because traffic's not backing up. It's flowing down to the lower body. Let's keep an eye on pulses, cap refill, all our indicators of perfusion in the lower extremities. We need to be checking pulses and blood pressures in all four limbs, documenting any differences, and alerting the healthcare provider if there is a gradient. This kiddo was able to go home just a couple days post-op. Within one week, he followed back up with his pediatrician. He was not having any more nosebleeds or headaches. He was running around back to normal life, playing soccer with his friends and living it up like every six-year-old should. So this is one of those things that can be very scary, but luckily has a great outcome if you keep an eye out for those signs and catch it quickly. So that being said, that brings us back to our practice question. Remember, we are assessing a client who is suspected of having coarctation of the aorta. What findings would support the diagnosis? So it's a select all that apply. I'm going to read them one at a time, and I want you to shout out, whether you're walking to class, in the car, whatever, shout out, yes or no, would this finding support a diagnosis of coarctation of the aorta? What about A, a bounding radial pulse? Yes, absolutely. Lots of blood flow up top, bounding radial pulses. Okay, B, what about diminished pedal pulses? Yes, again, absolutely. We're backing up, not getting a lot of blood flow down to those feet. So diminished pedal pulses, yes. Lots of blood up top, not a lot down below. Now we have C, a cool lower extremity. Would that support coarctation of the aorta? Again, yes, absolutely. Blood up top, we're going to be nice and warm, but not down below. Cool, pale, clammy, mottled. C, cool lower extremities is correct. Now, D, would wide pulse pressure indicate we have a coarctation? 
No, incorrect. We are not looking at a widened pulse pressure. What is a pulse pressure? It's the difference between the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure. That's not what I'm worried about. I'm worried about the gradient of what the blood pressure looks like between our top and our bottom parts of the body. So if my systolic of my upper extremity is 140, but then on my leg, it's 100, that's a gradient. That's a difference. And that tells me we've got blood backing up up top. But a widened pulse pressure, not what we are going to be worried about in coarctation. So that one, D, incorrect. Last but not least, E, I think you're going to know it, headaches and nosebleeds. Yes, that was what we had in our case study with our six-year-old because he had chronic hypertension, lots of blood up top, and that can lead to headaches and nosebleeds if left untreated. All right, so that's your episode on coarctation of the aorta. Your key takeaway, remember, if you remember nothing else, blood up top, not a lot down below. That leads to all your symptoms. You've got this. All right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com. Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.